Well, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us. And those of you who are tuning in online, we're so glad that you are with us as well. It's a joy to be able to gather, <clears throat> to celebrate, to remember, and to honor the life of Marilyn Wright West. We hold to the memory of a devoted mother and grandmother and great-grandmother, a loving memory of a loving friend and a faithful follower of Jesus. On behalf of this family, I just want to say thanks for being present here today. You know, I've come to uh, really learn uh, and I think uh, truly believe that our presence matters, <clears throat> and our presence really matters at moments like this in sad and in difficult moments. Because your presence means that you cared for Marilyn. <clears throat> your presence means um, that you still care for her and that you still care for this family. Presence is what indicates <clears throat> that someone cares deeply for another being. And so your being here today really illustrates to this family um, that Marilyn's life mattered and that she impacted your life and vice versa. As we begin to prepare for this service today, we were given a rather detailed order of service, and uh, as a pastor, sometimes I like, give me, all, give me what you want. I want to know what you want, so we don't have to plan and uh, create all these different things. Marilyn gave us a lot of these details of what she wanted, what she wanted for this service here. Each passage of scripture heard today was picked by Marilyn. <clears throat> Every song that we'll sing or we will hear today was chosen by Marilyn. She had a vision for this service, and it was not to draw full attention to her, but it was truly to draw attention to the one whom she loved dearly and who loved her, which was Christ Jesus himself. She wanted each person to be given the opportunity today to hear and to read about Jesus. And so even in her death, she is declaring her love and her devotion to Jesus and she wanted to make sure that you had that opportunity as well. So you'll find in your bulletin there, uh, there is a track <clears throat> that tells about who Jesus is and his love and his work on the cross and the redemption of the world. That was Marilyn's wish that even in this opportunity here, that Jesus would be preached and that people would be able to understand and see what Jesus has done for them. She was a soul who wanted others to know Jesus and know the love of Jesus. And to that end, um, we even have that track there available to you there. So as we begin today in these moments that are a bit sad and also a bit grateful and thankful and uh, full of legacy of uh, Marilyn and her life, we want to um, just invite the Holy Spirit just to be with us and uh, to work in this time together today. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time to gather. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to remember Marilyn well, to honor her life. And Father, <clears throat> we are so thankful for the way that she touched so many lives. And Lord, we are so thankful for how she loved you so incredibly well that even today, Lord, she is proclaiming your goodness um, even uh, in everything that is said and sung and done today. We pray that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, and I pray your Holy Spirit would comfort this family, and Father, you would fill them with incredible memories and incredible joy of an incredible person that you gave to us. Marilyn was such a gift, and we thank you for her. We worship you today. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. 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 Like Pastor said, she picked out all the songs today. I like her taste in music. <laughs> She, uh, our first song is, It Is Well With My Soul. And Tom tells me she even wrote out the words so we'd sing the right words. So we're going to have the words up on the, on the screen. Let's all stand and sing, It Is Well With My Soul.
Amen. Let's be seated. All right. So obviously, I keep wanting to call her grandma. She's not grandma to everybody. <laughs> obviously, Marilyn was too humble to claim Proverbs 31. But I think we know what the obvious is here, right? Proverbs 31 woman. Okay. Moving on to the scheduled broadcasting. Isaiah chapter 40. And... Uh, that comes right after Isaiah 39, which I'll make this very brief, but to put this in context, uh, what's his name, Hezekiah, found out that some really bad stuff that looked like it was going to come down immediately was going to come down on the next generation. And he goes, oh, thank God, at least there's going to be peace in my day. So Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, is the voice of one shouting, clear the way through the wilderness. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Fill in the valleys Level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves. We got some road builders in this room. And smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see together. So has the Lord spoken. A voice saying, shout. And I said, what should I shout? Shout that the people are like grass. Beauty fades like the flowers in the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. The breath of the Lord blows on it. And so it is with people. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops, shout louder, Jerusalem. Shout it, do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the Lord God is coming with power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He'll feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his chest. And he will gently lead the mothers with young. Good afternoon, everyone. I have one thing I want to share about Marilyn. I was working with her at the greenhouse one time, and I think I don't think she needed the money. I think she wanted to be there so she could witness to the Lord about people. And I was a pretty new uh, Christian at that time, and and she was telling me that the Lord Jesus was a man, and that He walked on this earth and He didn't sin. And I, I, I said, that can't be. Nobody could do that. She says, well, it's true. And she says, you better go home and do a little studying. And I did. And she straightened me out on that fact, folks. And I thank God for it because without that, all is hopeless. All is hopeless. So I, I always remember that. Because not many people have corrected me in my life. And if you breathe that, i got a bridge I want to sell you. Uh, uh, okay, uh, what's going to happen in this song? And Marilyn, she either called me or she sent me a letter and says, call me. Or a note, and then I called her on the phone. And she says, Terry, I want you to sing at my service. And I said, 
well, Marilyn, I don't have a voice anymore very much. And she says, well, I want you to sing. And I said, well, I'll, I, I'll tell you this. If I have a voice, I'll sing. So I'm going to ask you guys to help me today. And uh, I'll sing the verses, and we'll all sing the choruses together. This is a, a, a really, really awesome song. It's one of those songs I think we'll be singing in heaven. Some we won't. It's called Christmas music nowadays, but some we will. And, and this is one of them, I believe, you know, because he lives. You can stand with me if you want, or you can stay seated. I don't know how you feel about singing, but uh, where I worship, the people sing better when they stand up. So you can do whatever you want to do. So uh, have we got the words up there? I need the words. Here we go. You guys got the words? Okay. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. And feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance. This child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then as death, yes, gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. Thank you for the help. Uh, I'm Marilyn's grandson, Evan, and she wanted me to read this poem to you today. It's called I'm Free, uh, the author is unknown. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. I'm following the path God has laid, you see. I took his hand when I heard his call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. 
I found the peace at close of the day. If my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joys, a friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss. Oh yes, those things I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full. I've savored much. Good friends, good times, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. I am Sandra Mix, Tom and Amber's middle child and grandma's granddaughter. I also should not have to read after that poem, so I brought my <laughs> tissues up here. When I gave my grandpa's eulogy, I didn't bring tissues, and I was a disaster, so bear with me. Good afternoon, everyone. The family wants to start by expressing our gratitude to all of you for being here today to celebrate the life of my incredible grandmother. Marilyn Noreen Wright. Losing a loved one is never easy. However, creating a loving and heartfelt tribute to my grandma is an important part of the healing process and an avenue for me to share just how special she was. There aren't enough words to describe the love, wisdom, and strength she brought into our lives. Today, I hope to honor her memory by sharing some of the wonderful moments I shared with her as her granddaughter. My grandma, Marilyn Wright, was born in Colfax, Washington to Daniel and Ethel Miller on August 18, 1931. She was lucky enough to have two wonderful brothers, Gerald and Lauren Miller, who are also deceased. Her two children, Tom and Wendy, are here today, as well as her five grandchildren and many great-grandchildren. Grandma moved many times and attended many schools in her younger years. However, she spent much of her high school career at Marshfield High School. Midway through her senior year, her family moved to Walla Walla, Washington, where she finished high school and met my grandpa, Everett Wright. After a short eight months of dating, they were engaged and married shortly after in Walla Walla, Washington. At this time, my grandma's parents, Ethel and Daniel, lived on Five Mile Arm of Tackanich Lake. When Grandma and Grandpa came down to visit them, my grandpa was offered a logging job, which led to them moving to Reedsport. They were married for 65 years when my grandpa passed away. My grandparents purchased their ranch, the Lazy W, up Dean Creek in 1954. This is the same ranch that my siblings and I were raised on, the ranch my parents continue to live on, and the ranch my kids get to enjoy when we come to Reedsport. While Grandma worked as a, I can't even read the words on this anymore. While Grandma worked as a store clerk, secretary, bookkeeper, and completed janitorial jobs, many of her younger married years were spent on the farm. She fed cattle, assisted the cows in birthing, gave animals their shots, milked goats, gardened, canned, and raised their two children, Tom and Wendy. This ranch holds endless memories with my grandma. My siblings and I spent nearly as much time at her house as we did ours, since we were 100 yards from one another. My sister and I thought we would share a few of these memories. They had wild huckleberries that were growing up the hill in their backyard, and every summer when the huckleberries were in season, we would run down to grandma's, pick lots of huckleberries, and then grandma and I would make huckleberry muffins. This is probably the memory that I hold dearest with my grandma. Somehow, she always had time to make muffins with me. This was a time of connection and bonding with grandma that I'm so appreciative of. We remember that we had to spend an hour a day weeding in my grandparents' garden in the summer. It's not really a fond memory, but... While we picked the produce and weeded, Grandma spent her time canning. She had an entire cellar of canned foods that was raised on the farm. 
We remember grandma making five gallon buckets of sauerkraut from the cabbage in the garden. She would do it up in the house. And the smell in the house was so potent, I either had to plug my nose when I'd go to visit or not visit the week that she was making sauerkraut. We remember milking goats and running the fresh milk up to grandma. Grandma didn't usually come down to the barn to milk goats. We would run the milk up to her, and then she would use a coffee filter to strain and clean the milk for drinking. We remember grandma stepping on her front porch and ringing the dinner bell hanging on the exterior of the house, which signaled grandpa and sometimes the grandkids to come to the house for a meal. We remember Friday night popcorn nights after dinner on Pretty much every Friday when we were younger, my whole family would head to grandma and grandpa's. We would have popcorn, play games. Grandma loved to play, you know, colon dominoes especially. And we would watch slides of trips that grandma and grandpa had taken. Grandma also loved photography. She loved to play kids with her, games with her grandkids, primarily card games. In fact, we played card games with her every year of our lives. This past Thanksgiving, even with grandma at the age of 92, we still played card games with her at our dinner table. Her great-grandchildren even learned her love of playing cards. We remember her and my grandpa snowboarding in Mexico and bringing back our Christmas gifts of Coca-Cola socks or t-shirts that read, someone went to Mexico and all they brought me was this lousy t-shirt. We used to wonder what gift at the flea market we would get at our next birthday or Christmas. It was a running joke with my brother, sister, and I. We remember Bible study at her house each week where she focused on two scriptures, John 3.16 and Psalm 23. One of the traits I admired most about my grandmother was her incredible patience combined with a smile. I never saw her lose her temper, not one time in my life. My grandma had this smile that calmed worries, made you feel loved appreciated and even special. Even in her darkest hours, she smiled. During family gatherings, Grandma would sit back, listen to the conversations happening, and just smile. She loved her family deeply. Speaking about smiling, Grandma was reunited with her high school sweetheart, Otis West, at the age of 85. She was incredibly happy in the five years that they were gifted together before he passed away. He renewed her life. He renewed life in her and brought an incredible amount of contentment and happiness to her. My grandmother's unwavering strength was awe-inspiring. Grandma had severe scoliosis. She lived much of her life that I remember in pain. She showed us what it meant to be a strong, resilient woman, always showing grace. Her ability to push through difficult times while providing undying love to her family sets a legacy that will always be remembered. I remember about 25 years ago, she had a, an extensive back surgery to correct her spine in Boise, Idaho. Our whole family went with her. Even through the pain and recovery that came with this procedure, Grandma smiled through it. Family was important to Grandma. So was her love of Christ. She considered her greatest accomplishments in life as the times she was able to lead others to accepting Christ as Savior and Lord. She taught Sunday school to all ages over the years. She served as the church treasurer, the Christian service director, and held many other roles within the church. She left us with peace in her heart and the anticipation of eternity with her God and loved ones who have accepted the salvation he offered. Speaking on behalf of my sister and I, we are grateful for the time we had with our grandma. We consider ourselves. We consider ourselves lucky to have been so close to her during our lifetime. Her spirit and memory will live on in our hearts. To our dear grandmother, commit it. Thank you for always listening, guiding, and the warm embrace we could always count on. We will carry the lessons and love you have gifted us throughout our lives. And we promise to honor your memory by cherishing our family and remembering the values you instilled in us. 
Please give Grandpa a hug and tell Jason, our brother, we miss. We still miss him dearly. Rest in peace, my beautiful grandmother, until we meet again. Since I was given the microphone, I just have one more thing I need to add. And by the way, Grandma planned everything but her eulogy, or who was to give it? I can't believe she hadn't planned that out. But I gave my grandpas, so I thought I should give my grandmas too. I just want to take the time really quick to acknowledge my dad. After grandpa passed away, I watched my dad step up and take care of my grandma's every need and our ranch's every need. He was her grocery shopper, her errand runner, the first call if she didn't feel well, her driver to appointments, the person my grandma turned to for every need or want and her nearly daily visitor at the end. Dad, if I could treat you half as good as you treated Grandma these past years, you could consider yourself a lucky man. What you've done for Grandma was amazing, all while taking absolutely no credit for your commitment. You are the picture of selfless love. I stood in old Jerusalem beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, I thought the voice of angels from heaven in answering. I thought the voice of angels from Answering Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and sing. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to your My dream was changed, the streets no longer rang. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. And the sun grew dark with mystery, the morn was cold and chill. As a shadow of a cross arose upon the lonely hill, as a shadow. Oh, my. 
many memories. Wonderful. We want to give everyone, if you'd like, an opportunity to share some of your memories also. So I have the microphone here. I'm happy to come to you. If you could introduce yourself, just say who you are, how you knew Marilyn, and uh, we'll start right here, Wendy. Okay. So I just about had a heart attack. I I would go hunting. We, we went to Eastern Oregon every fall to deer hunt uh, as a family. So I think Tom and Dad would go out, you know, and beat the brush. I'd go with Mom, and we would just sit on a rim rock real quiet. So I'm sitting beside her, and BAM! I almost fell off the log and off the rim rock, and I go, Mom, what? She said, 
She got a beautiful four, I mean gorgeous, I have the rack, and dad couldn't stand it. He had gotten her gun, she always out hunted him, just sitting. So he, he gave her a gun that didn't work. Yeah, I mean, he did everything he could to sabotage her hunting. But she, anyway, finally, she, he did get her a beautiful custom-made uh, burly maple stock, and, and I've inherited that. It fits me perfect. And I just killed a, my elk this, this year with, with, uh, with it. But anyway, that, that was just so much fun. We didn't even have a knife. I mean, basically, we went out to enjoy Mother Nature. I don't think we expected to bag the prize buck. I had a little uh, Yellowstone Park souvenir knife. I think I was eight years old. It was not sharp. It wouldn't even be a good letter opener. And we managed to somehow stab a hole and bleed out that deer. But I just wanted to tell you, she was a tremendous hunter, and Dad couldn't stand it. <laughs> so I'm Tom, the son. So I was hunting with Dad over somewhere else, and we're, we're walking along, and... Mom was hunting then with a, a 222, which I don't know if it's even legal to hunt deer with such a small caliber. And, and we heard that shot, and he says, your mom just killed a deer, because it doesn't sound like a big, powerful rifle. You know, so, yeah, sure enough, she did. Yeah, right. Uh, no game wardens here today, right? <laughs> Who else? Hi, I'm uh, Jim Mex and my wife, Linda. We're happy to be here. We've been in the church for years, and it's so nice to see Carol Thompson up there on the piano and Wes Locker leading the music and Kristen, the assistant associate pastor. And I hear you've got a great new pastor, so we saw a lot of those. Uh, anyway, I, I have to give you a little bit of history here because... Uh, I taught school in Reedsport and Linda did. In fact, I think Linda might have had Kristen in first grade. <laughs> We're not that old, but he did too. Okay. Uh, and I saw Terry in Newport. We were comparing ages. Oh, and thank you for your beautiful voice again. That was great to hear. We're about the same age, so we're both still, still kids. <laughs> uh, but years ago, in 1967, I started teaching here at the high school. <clears throat> and... They have a thing called back to school night or something. I don't remember what it was called, but the parents came in. And I don't know if they still do any of that kind of things or not. But <clears throat> so my very first year of teaching, I'm, I'm sure it was my first year because I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, you meet some of the parents that come in and they always want to know why their kid's in trouble and, and was he going to pass the class. And it happened to be typing class of all things, which was, was great. We had a lot of fun teaching typing over the years. Anyway, so near the halfway through the middle, this nice lady came in and sat down and waited patiently, and then she came up to me and she said, um, my name is Marilyn Wright. And I said, oh, very nice to meet you. And I thought, wait a minute, I thought the parents came because they had kids that were in trouble. <laughs> if this is the mother of Tom Wright, this, this can't be right. So I can't be right. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was right, and so she wanted to know how Tom was doing in class. And I said, well, you know, I've got a lot of kids in class here, but I think Tom is probably the most perfect kid in my, all my classes, and besides that, I can't even get him to talk, let alone get in trouble talking. <laughs> Not like his sister. <laughs> but that was a different year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great student, but... Um, so we developed a relationship then in 1967. It was a long time ago, if you count that. But she also ended up, uh, as Sandra talked about all the things that they did, she did a wonderful job of raising, helping raise all these kids, Tom in, in particular and Amber. But uh, she uh, has a, a granddaughter by the name of Sandra who grew up as a San Sandra Wright, and she's now Sandra Mix. <laughs> 
And little did we know that someday when that quiet guy I had in typing was going to be the father of, of my beautiful daughter-in-law. So, and you did a good job today, Sandra, by the way. Anyway, it was, it's, it was, but with, I guess the thing is the years went on, obviously we got to uh, know each other a lot better, Marilyn, and she's probably one of the few, I'm not trying to be critical here, but one of the few ladies who I met who could sit down and talk investments and investing and money for hours, and, and she was just fascinating. So we'd go out to Tom's house, and they'd have, you know, one of the, the holidays, and we'd sit down and talk investments and so forth, and I think that's one reason that she had a comfortable life all the way till what, age 93, is because of how she managed her money and her finances, but what a, what a beautiful woman, and uh, that's why we traveled down from McMinnville today. We, we couldn't uh, miss honoring her, so thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'm Terry Thompson, Otis West's daughter, and I will always remember the first time I met her and she had the sparkling eyes and that um, beautiful smile and the ever-present laughter. And the last visit that I got to share with her when she was still alert and talking, she had a bump on her head and I commented on it and she just laughed and she said, you should see the other guy. <laughs> and I guess that's what I'm always going to carry with me is that beautiful smile and the laughter. And thank you for the opportunity to, to have loved her. Thanks, Terry. I remember most about Marilyn being a woman of prayer. And um, there was a time in our church when um, we had very, very few um, musicians. And uh, I was concerned about that. And so I asked Jenny Pritchard and Marilyn, uh, and Evelyn Mayfield, if they would join me in praying for uh, musicians for our church. And things went along for a while, and it seemed like nothing was happening. And then all of a sudden, we just were deluged with really, really fine musicians uh, who had uh, the desire to serve. Uh, in our church, and I will always remember Marilyn's uh, faith that that would come to pass because we prayed. Thanks. I'm Wes Lockard. Um, I'm not an old timer like Jim and Terry. We, Vindy and I, only came 51 years ago to to this community and church and. We were newlyweds before the kids came, and Marilyn was one of the, the few adults here who really helped model the Christian adult life to us, just in not only word, but in just in demonstrating how to live, and very helpful to us. Vindy and I, Vindy's not here today. She has some sort of bug, and she decided not to share the joy with other people, but she did write something for me, because we were talking and remembering stories about Marilyn this last week, and kind of having fun trading stories back and forth. This is what Vindy wrote. Marilyn was always helpful and cheerful. I enjoyed the adult Sunday school that she taught. She welcomed questions and input. You always felt valued. She came over to our house to help me in understanding what it was to take care of a home, lessons in being a housewife. She was kind and caring, helping me without making me feel insecure. I loved her laugh. And I was sharing with Vindy, I, the thing that I always remembered about Marilyn, I thought she was just super smart and really wise and very kind. And one of the stories I shared with Vindy was, and she did, I didn't remember that she had come over to help Vindy. She didn't remember this story of me. It was this years ago, but I was having some sort of conflict with another guy. I can't even remember what it was about. But I happened to share to Marilyn my frustration that... This guy obviously didn't like me much. <laughs> and uh, she said, I'll tell you what you ought to do. 
go get a gift basket of like food and fruit and stuff and take it over and give it to this guy and his wife at their front door. And I, I never would have in a million years thought of that, but I did it. Worked like a charm. I'm, the, I mean, it's not that we were best buddies after that, but no problems after that. And that's just, I think, that life experience and wisdom. And I was so grateful to be a beneficiary of that. A few years back when Everett and Marilyn were still traveling, we got talking about our common Scottish heritage. She was very proud of her Scottish heritage. And there is a big festival of, of uh, all things Scottish in Colorado, and Vinny and I were planning to, to go to it. And that got Marilyn's attention. So they ended up coming. You know, we spent a week together in Colorado, and we went to the, the Highland Games and the clan meetings and the, the dances and the parades and stuff. And then every evening, the four of us together, I'm sure you can't imagine this, but the word rate was probably a couple thousand words a minute, you know. And we'd talk until we just were at you know, 2 o'clock in the morning and get up and do it all again the next day. Just a really fun week together with them. They were just a wonderful couple. And I want to thank the family for sharing mom and grandma with us. She's just a wonderful woman. So I'm Vivian Wright Cummings, and Marilyn was my support person. And we moved here when I was 13. My dad built Mar Everett Marilyn's house and the little house that Wendy lives in now, and we lived there. So Marilyn, I was here when I was 13. At the age of fifth, well, I babysat for Tom and for Amber, got, or Tom and Wendy, made 25 cents an hour babysitting. <laughs> I helped plant the blueberry, or the huckleberry bushes that Sandra and the kids picked huckleberries on and the rhododendrons that were up behind the house. So if we worked for, if we got to eat dinner, if we helped out. So then as time went on and, and through high school, she was my support person. At the age of 16, 15, 16, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And a lot of the people in this church knew that about me. Marilyn was my support person. Vivian, you will walk again someday. God knows you will walk again someday. I wanted you to live in an apartment like my friends. She bought me a set of towels and said, someday you'll have an apartment. And because of Marilyn's encouragement, I was able to ride my bike to San Francisco from Eugene. I raised two kids. I worked with toddlers first, clear through first grade for 17 years. So, and Marilyn was always, whenever I would come to Reedsport as my getaway, I'd go down there and Marilyn would always feed me and listen. <laughs> she was always there for me. So, anyway, I loved my Aunt Marilyn. I couldn't have done it without her. Okay, and I will share. She helped me with my education to figure out what I wanted to do after I got so I could move again. So we went out to Eugene. She took me to the Easter Seal School. I wanted to go there and... The, um, Pearl Buck School. Then I ended up going on to college, but it was all because, a lot of it, because of Marilyn's encouragement. So thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you. Who else? I'm Jeffrey Wicks. I'm uh, Grandma's grandson. She's never been Marilyn to me. She's just Grandma, because she's Grandma to everything and everybody she ever met that I'm I'm the weirdo of the family I always have been I'm, look at me <laughs> but she loved me no matter what any mistake any stupid thing that I ever did I could just go talk to grandma she give me that, that smile and make it all better. The world is a lot less bright without her in it. But the way she brightened it is immeasurable, like her patience and her love.
Marilyn didn't have the opportunity to pursue an education. She didn't keep her from teaching, though. And she taught a lot of people, and she was a youth teacher here when I was growing up. Before I knew her, I knew George and Audrey and had gone to their house with mom and dad. And George knew I was getting bored being there, and he said, go on up the street and talk to Tom. Well, I didn't know who Tom was. So I went up there, and there was a horse, so I talked to the horse. <laughs> and he came back, and they said, did you find Tom? He says, well, I think so. <laughs> But then I did get acquainted with Marilyn and, and Tom and, and uh, Wendy and, and had a relationship with them and, and over all those years. But she just was a very encouraging person. When you weren't feeling so good about yourself, she could pick you up and encourage you and love you. And I so appreciated that about her. Anyone else? All right, are you all ready for the dark side? <laughs> this was a woman who read, studied, and mostly believed the health information on, the, on foods. So I was accustomed in, in my day to eating ones of bags of chips. So that is a one serving object because my hand can reach to the bottom of the bag and uh, I'm capable of eating them all. It makes me feel nice. Uh, that's not great health practice, and I knew that Grandma knew that, and so I was shocked when she offered me chips. I didn't even know she owned chips. <laughs> There's not any healthy reason to own corn chips, especially today, but she offered me chips, and I was like, yes, awesome. I should have known. She brought me one of the small bowls, and that's when I knew this was my grandma, of course. I should have known this. There were either five or six Fritos chips in there, and that is one serving of chips. <laughs> and that's a little bit more than a healthy serving of chips. And this is a woman who treated her body like a treasure that she would be able to use to bless other people. And she taught me that by example, and I will never forget that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Evan, and uh, Sandra, thank you. I probably won't stop crying for the next week. Thanks for that. But I'm going to try to talk anyway. Um, Marilyn was always an example to me, and uh, she's one of the people who has had some of the greatest impact on my life, and I... I hope who I have become. Uh, I always want to emulate her. I always want to have the patience and the quick smile and the lack of judgment. She could be stern. She could be no nonsense when she needed to. But there was never judgment. And Jeffrey, you're right, the world's a little less bright without her here, but a lot of that light goes on in the rest of us. And that's something to celebrate. So I want to celebrate her and the legacy that she will continue to leave here with us. Thanks, Evan. Anyone else? Well, we're live streaming it, so that'll help. My name is Bill Brock. I uh, went to high school here. I came into this community when I was about 12, 13 years old uh, from a, you know, pretty uh, a military environment, Colorado Springs, in the middle of the Vietnam War, lots of questions going on, the assassinations of so many of our politicians and leaders at that time, a real time of uh, extreme change, and she was the only one that didn't see me as a problem, but as someone who had questions. <laughs> uh, 
she was part of this church, and this church together uh, saved me and uh, made me into a, the man I am today, successful, kind, loving, and gentle because of Marilyn Wright and her example to me. She always stood behind me. I broke my leg in football. Don't let your kids play football. Uh, badly. Yeah. <laughs> badly. And, and so somehow or other, she talked my parents into, you know, putting him out of my place. So I sat in their living room for weeks in my little cast, and I read wa uh, Watership Down, and we talk about everything. Uh, and that was very philosophical in those days. You know, so she was right there. Just, you know, and she's always had a big smile, and there's always that goat milk. <laughs> you know, to this day, I can't get over the goat milk. Uh, I just want to uh, express my desire to leave an impression on this planet like she did. Well, if there are still some stories, uh, we hope that you will share those with the family as we gather after this time. Well, I have so appreciated hearing your memories of Marilyn as mother and grandmother and great-grandmother and friend. And it's really important for you to know that this meticulously planned service is all her doing, as Justin said. I've never seen a more carefully annotated plan for a memorial service. <laughs> and as much as possible, we've attempted to follow her instructions to the letter. Marilyn brought her children, Tom and Wendy, to this church in 1967, 57 years ago. Five years before I would walk through these doors as a seven-year-old. And throughout those nearly six decades, she played an outsized role in the life of this church and in my life as well. In the 1970s, she was a youth leader in our church, working with Bob and Bonnie Cantrell and Bob's famous pancake breakfasts that attracted 20% of the high school student body each week. And together with Bill, also, they built a youth group into a thriving, irresistible group in this community. We have a clipping in a church scrapbook that uh, shows a photo from 1975 with a group of 64 raucous teenagers getting ready to go up to Camp White Branch on the McKenzie Highway for a snow camp. And Marilyn led the Bible study sessions and the devotional times, and the students reported the camp as one of the very best that they had ever attended. She kept her own bulging scrapbook filled with letters from students who later wrote to her to thank her for her teaching and her ministry in their lives. This leadership, this commitment to teaching scripture was a constant in my understanding of Marilyn over the decades, as some of you have said as well. In the Nazarene church that she attended previously, she served as the Sunday school superintendent, the church treasurer, the Christian service director, missions director, and the district convention delegate. And then for over 45 years, she taught adult Sunday school classes. I remember her often being called upon to lead intercessory prayer in our church services and in all of our evening events. And I remember as a child that I guess I should say I was impressed with the length of her prayers. But as I aged, I began to recognize in them an intimacy with the Father, an easy familiarity in conversation with the Lord. Her stature was small, but for me, she towered as a leader and teacher in our church, a rare woman even within our movement's long historic tradition of women pastors, who embodied her leadership positions earnestly and faithfully, humbly and unapologetically and gracefully. She was, as some of you have said, a woman of fierce intelligence, an intelligence that she applied to her Bible study and teaching, as well as her savvy financial investing, as you said, Jim. Everett used to say that Marilyn made far more money than he ever had. 
He brought it home. She studied it. She studied and she invested it and she made it multiply. And tell me if I get this right, Tom, but you told me the story of a representative of an investment firm driving up the rutted roads to the ranch in his Rolls Royce to try to recruit Marilyn to work for them. Can you imagine that? I'm told he was unsuccessful. Everett also used to say to Marilyn uh, that she was hatched from a roadrunner because of how she loved to travel. Three months traveling through Europe with Wendy when you were there, down to Spain and Portugal with Everett, a cruise with the whole family in the Bankston singing group, snowbird winters in Arizona and Mexico, and nearly the entire state, United States in their motor home, including an incredible drive one year all the way down to Puerto Vallarta. Sandra, you talked about her unfailing smile. I also observed that enduring smile even when she was bent nearly double with her, uh, the pain of a scoliosis scarred spine. There were other struggles and sorrows in Marilyn's life as well. And some of you who are gathered here today have shared with her and lived through those sorrows and those struggles. And still, her smile prevailed. I'd like to try to give a reason for that gentle smile this afternoon, a reason that Marilyn noted in her instructions that she left behind for us today. And I know that she would want us to understand. This is what she wrote. God spoke to me in a time of deep despair. He said, I am all you need. Those words changed my life. God was all she needed. That was her life-changing revelation that she proved over and over through her nine decades of life. God was all she needed. She went on to say that love, joy, and peace are fruit of God's spirit, as found in Galatians 5, and that means man cannot take those away from us. That smile of Marilyn's that we remember that was the outward manifestation of the inner love, joy, and peace she was drawing from God's presence in her life, providing everything she needed to persevere, to thrive, to triumph. One of Marilyn's favorite verses relays Jesus' words to his disciples in John 5, 24. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. As Christians, we are gathered here today in this church to testify that because of Marilyn's faith, she has passed from death into life. She is seeing Jesus face to face. She is whole and well and strong in that promised place in God's presence where there will be no more pain or suffering or tears or death. But these words of Jesus mean something for our lives right now, too, as they did for Marilyn while she was still living with us in the confines of time in this present age. Jesus is saying, those who listen to his message and believe in God who sent him have eternal life. That's the present tense, not the future tense. Right now, those of us who believe in Jesus and listen have eternal life. We will never be condemned. That's a little bit of the present or the future tense right there, but then we're right back into the present because we have already passed from death into life. The life we're living right now is the beginning of our eternal life, the abundant life that Jesus promises us. We who listen and believe and follow Jesus are already part of his kingdom, living with his power, propelled by his spirit. That smile of Marilyn's, that patience that Sandra talked about, that love and joy and peace that Marilyn wrote about, those are evidence of Jesus' work in her, in the Spirit's presence, the completed work of already having passed from death into life. 
She wasn't perfect. She would have been the first to admit that. She still struggled and she suffered. But she was already tasting the supernatural, unexplainable joy of living with Jesus, experiencing the beginnings of his eternal life here on earth that she now enjoys in all its glorious fullness. Marilyn summed it up herself this way. My only significant accomplishments are the times I was able to lead others to accepting Christ as Savior and Lord. And then she went on to say, the rewards have been the joy of the Lord, peace in my heart, strength in bearing my burdens, and the anticipation of eternity with my God and my loved ones who have accepted the salvation he has offered. I think that is her invitation to us today, those she loved the most in all the world. Listen to Jesus' message and believe in God so you will have eternal life. Eternal life that starts right now in the present tense. If you listen and believe, you will never be condemned for your sins, but you will already have passed from life into death. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you so much for Marilyn's life, for her example of how to navigate the joys and the sorrows of this life here on earth with you by her side. We thank you so much for her smile, her patience, her fierce intelligence, her leadership in this church family, her hard work, her amazing love for her family and friends. We thank you for putting her in our lives, and we thank you for her faith in you that enables her now to be in your presence. Thank you for your promise of life with you, of your presence that will wipe every tear from our eyes, that will banish all death and sorrow and crying and pain. God, we trust in that promise. For now, though, in this season of our lives, we trust your promise of peace in the midst of sorrow. Please be with those who loved Marilyn so much and comfort them. Bring to mind those wonderful memories of love and laughter that will sustain and surround them. God, we thank you for your presence with us today in this holy space and time. For your promise that those who listen and believe will never face condemnation, but have already passed from death into life here and now. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song chosen by Marilyn. Uh, words on the screen. May the Lord mighty God. This is sung to the tune of Edelweiss. We're so glad that you are here today to honor and to celebrate Marilyn's life. As you go today, don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. Trust in God and in God's Son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and through whom we come to know the Father. And may the blessing of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence and comfort of the Holy Spirit go with you today as you leave this place. Go in His peace. We will invite you right after this service uh, that there is a lunch downstairs. The family invites you to participate, to hang out, and uh, maybe continue to share in some memories uh, of Marilyn. Have a great day.
God told me years ago, I said, well, I can't hear the words. And you know, that sounds terrible. You know what he told me? He said, I'm making a piece of you, and you sound good. I said, Jesus. I'm still doing it, I guess. Love for growing things in his young son's heart. And that teacher left her wisdom in the minds of lots of children. Give them all a better start. And that preacher whispered, Can't you see the promised land? As he laid his blood stained Bible in that hooker's hand. There are three wooden crosses on the right side of. 